In the 1930s, to get away from it all, you might head to the movie theater. It was the golden age of cinema. The movies were a way to see life through Hollywood's eyes. They were a way to escape. Will you please take off your hat? But what exactly was everyone escaping from? After all, coming right after the roaring 20s, the 30s couldn't have been all that bad. Raise your right hand. Will you get rid of that hat? Oklahoma, in the American Southwest, spring 1932. Everywhere you looked, you should have seen the green shoots of new crops, a foot high, the promise of a rich harvest just weeks away. But you didn't. You saw dust. It blew across the fields and piled against fences and farm buildings like mud-colored snow. It got into your clothes, your eyes, and ears. It came through cracks in the doors and windows and got into the food you ate. And worse, sometimes it came rolling across the landscape in dust storms so monstrous you couldn't believe your eyes. As bad as the drought was, it was nothing compared to the economic disaster that hit the entire world in those same years. The Great Depression. To understand it, we have to go back a few years to the Great War. World War I raged over the fields of Europe from 1914 to 1918. America joined the war in 1917. America lost more than 116,000 soldiers. Another 200,000 were wounded. More than 20 million people died as a result of the First World War. The end of the war caused great celebration all over the world. Families were reunited and people couldn't wait to get back to living normal lives again. Allied soldiers who were lucky enough to survive the trenches were surprised to find little work. America was one of the first to get its post-war economy moving again. The assembly lines that had churned out war materials were soon mass-producing new products. Airplanes, radios, automobiles, kitchen appliances. As manufacturing increased, people started finding work again. And with regular paychecks and easy credit, they started buying again. And the more they bought, the more business boomed. This simple economic cycle kick-started the economy, and America was back on the rails. Another economic boom had happened much earlier on the wheat fields of the Great Plains. Europe's agricultural economy had been torn apart by the fighting, and throughout the war, and immediately after, it desperately needed wheat and flour. U.S. farmers took advantage of this demand. They bought more land and machinery and began growing and selling wheat like never before. But as it recovered from the war, Europe grew less dependent on imports and all wheat-growing countries soon found themselves in trouble. There was simply too much wheat on the world market. Prices started to fall in the late 20s not drastically at first, but enough to make a few farmers question if they should have bought all that new machinery and land on credit. 
In the 1920s, most European countries were busy trying to save their industries and their economies from the devastation of the First World War. Britain had suffered very badly during the conflict and had borrowed very heavily from the United States to pay for its war effort. It needed to get its economy moving again so it could repay that debt. France, too, owed money it had borrowed to pay for the war. But it wasn't doing too badly. Its economy had a gradual but solid recovery throughout the 20s. In Germany, things went from bad to worse. In 1919, at the Palace of Versailles, just outside of Paris, France, a peace treaty between the Allies and the Germans was signed. In it, Germany officially accepted the blame for causing World War I. As punishment, and as a way to pay back to the victors what fighting the war had cost, Germany agreed to pay reparations, 131 billion gold marks. Eventually, Germany and the Allies worked out a payment schedule for reparations by implementing the Dawes Plan. This plan allowed Germany to negotiate huge loans from the United States, which resulted in increased employment. In the latter half of the 20s, things in Germany were beginning to look hopeful again. As the 1920s unfolded, the United States found itself in the economic driver's seat. Its economy was booming. A 10-year party broke out, the Roaring Twenties. The crazes of the Twenties reflected the attitude of a people determined to enjoy prosperous times. Flappers in bobbed haircuts dancing the Charleston the rise of jazz and blues music. Alcohol was prohibited in 1920, but bootleg whiskey, supplied by very competitive gangsters, was smuggled into thousands of speakeasies. Times were good, jobs were plentiful, and people were starting to live the American dream. There was another craze that captured America's attention in the 20s. Playing the stock market. Credit made it easy. You could buy any amount of stock for as little as 10% of its value and borrow the rest. Here's how it worked. If you wanted to buy a thousand shares of a company's stock, which is priced at $10 a share, the total price would be $10,000 but you could purchase all 1,000 shares by paying only $1,000, 10% of the full price. This down payment is known as the margin. When the shares rose in value, as they always seemed to do in the 20s, you paid off the loan with your profits. This is called buying on margin, and as long as the value of the shares kept going up, everything would work out okay. But if the value of the shares dropped dramatically, you'd still be liable for the $9,000 loan. You'd still have to pay it back. And your broker would be putting pressure on you to do just that. By the mid-20s, the new popularity of playing the market and easy credit, of course, began to make stocks very much in demand. And that caused their value to keep rising. But this value was based on the demand for the stock, not the performance or actual worth of the company. As a result, the stock of most companies was greatly overvalued. At the same time, all through 1929, there were indications that domestic and foreign markets for manufactured goods, wheat and steel were starting to slip. Europe had recovered from the war and was much less dependent on North American goods. And many countries had started to put tariffs on imports to protect their domestic markets. <laughs> 
Unable to sell as much of their goods, American factories started to stockpile their products, but kept right on producing. By mid-1929, the market had started to show signs of instability. Sudden trading bursts and price drops became almost routine. Experts warned that a drastic correction was fast approaching. So there were signs, much of them ignored, that the marketplace was out of balance and that something had to shift. October 24th, Black Thursday. The market opened with a burst of selling. Then a downward trend in stock prices scared investors into quickly selling more of their stock to limit their losses. Before the day was out, almost 13 million shares had been traded. And then came Black Tuesday, October 29th. From the opening bell, it was obvious something was wrong. There was an immediate explosion of selling. Investors seemed determined to get rid of vast amounts of stock before it dropped any more in value. Brokers began calling their clients to pay their margin, but it wasn't possible. Investors had banked on their profits to pay their loans, and their profits were disappearing in front of their eyes. Soon, full panic set in. So many traders trying to dump so much stock so fast caused prices to plummet. Investors, unable to reach their brokers, swarmed to the stock exchange. Police were called to control the crowd. When the smoke cleared, share prices had recovered only slightly. But the amount of trading that day was astounding. More than 16 million shares. In the days that followed, their value kept dropping dramatically. Over the next two years, they would drop to rock bottom, and $50 billion would simply vanish. Thousands of investors were ruined, and public confidence in the American economy was shattered. Banks were hit very hard. They too had invested in the market, and as their investments dwindled, they began calling in their loans and mortgages. But their clients were in the same boat. They were broke too. This led to many banks being wiped out. Some banks did manage to keep going. But people soon decided that their money wasn't very safe in any bank. And they began withdrawing it in record numbers. Many banks soon ran out of cash to cover their investors' deposits, and they too had to shut their doors. In the U.S. alone, almost 10,000 banks were forced to close. With the crash, businesses and factories couldn't pretend anymore that markets would pick up, so they stopped producing and laid off their workers. In a healthy economy, it's important for everyone to keep spending, paying wages, buying products, investing in banks, lending to business. But with so many having lost their jobs, spending declined. Products wouldn't sell. Then deflation set in. This means that prices started to drop. This had the result of decreasing spending even further. After all, if you knew prices would be lower tomorrow, why would you spend your money today? This marked the beginning of a time of great suffering and agitation all across America. Men chose to sell apples on the street or shine shoes rather than ask for charity. If a job did become available, the unemployed lined up by the thousands, hoping for the best. <laughs> 
soup kitchens and bread lines became the main source of food for the jobless. Demonstrations by thousands of unemployed, known as hunger marches, appeared in many major cities. A hunger march in Detroit where thousands of jobless demanded work at the gates of the Ford auto plant got out of hand. Police opened fire and five marchers were killed. In Chicago, the wooden cobblestones were dug out of the streets to use for firewood. Most Americans were still working. In fact, many remember the Depression years as a gentle, uncomplicated time. But for those without work, it was brutal. At its worst, 25% of the workforce would be unemployed and as many as a quarter million Americans would be homeless. In their efforts to increase production, farmers had done a great deal of damage to the land. Overgrazing and overplowing left too much of the soil exposed. When the hot, dry winds of the 30s began to blow, they carried the dusty soil away. By 1931, the drought had established itself over much of the Great Plains. It didn't take long for farmers to figure out that there was no way to make a profit. Unable to pay their mortgages, thousands of farmers lost their farms to the cash-starved banks. Many families simply left, packed up their few possessions, abandoned their farms, and headed out, hoping to find work. The migration of the unemployed was mostly westward. As they traveled, they looked for work or a new place to farm. With so many states affected by the drought, two and a half million migrants ended up in California. And they were hardly made to feel welcome. As their numbers grew, they were stopped at police checkpoints along the border to the Golden State. Migrants with no visible means of support were turned back. Others were fingerprinted and given a warning. California's new vagrancy laws would mean immediate arrest if they hung around street corners too long. While many families were uprooted, most of these wandering unemployed were men, some as young as 16. They got around by hitching a free ride on freight trains. These men would work for food. A sandwich and a cup of coffee would be paid for with chores like hoeing a garden or fixing a roof. They might find a place to sleep and maybe even a bite to eat in the hobo jungles. These were collections of shelters thrown together with cardboard, tin, old planks, and anything else they could find. These rickety settlements were called Hoovervilles after the president who most of these men blamed for the bad times. While a few of these men were content with this life on the road, most were desperate to find permanent work and return to a more normal family life. Herbert Hoover was unlucky enough to be president when the Depression hit. His Republican administration eventually put in place a program that helped businesses, banks, farmers, and the unemployed. But he was criticized for not doing enough for the poor, who he insisted were a local responsibility. And there was one incident in particular that sealed his fate. 
In 1932, many U.S. war veterans were unemployed and desperate. They'd been promised a cash bonus, an average of $1,000 per soldier, for serving in the First World War. This was to be paid in 1945. But with no income to feed their families, they wanted the bonus to be paid right away. Hoover didn't want to pay it. He felt the government was already paying too much for public relief programs. To put pressure on Hoover, the veterans marched on Washington. And by July 1932, 20,000 of them had reached the Capitol. When they got final word that they would not be getting their bonus, most of them left the city. But about 8,000 stayed behind to press the issue. Hoover ordered federal troops to run the protesters out of town. The army waded into the crowd with tear gas, bayonets, and drawn swords. Even a convoy of small tanks was brought in. After dispersing the crowd, the army invaded the marcher's encampment and burned it down. In the commotion, hundreds were injured, and two marchers were killed. And a baby died from inhaling tear gas. From that day, Hoover's reputation was set as a cruel, uncaring president. And in the election of 1932, he was overwhelmingly defeated. His replacement was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. FDR, they called him. A Democrat and a charismatic leader. His policies would reflect a renewal of confidence that he tried to instill in Americans. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. President Roosevelt took office in 1933. One of his first acts was to declare a bank holiday. He closed all the banks in the country for eight days. He did this to give the government time to come up with a plan to save the banking system. But FDR didn't stop there. Within a few weeks of taking office, he ended the prohibition of alcohol. It wasn't working anyway, and lifting it would allow the government to collect taxes on sales. Roosevelt then set up a whole slew of government agencies. There were so many of them that people started calling them the alphabet agencies. These would help to distribute emergency supplies, assist business, ensure bank deposits, regulate the stock market, and subsidize home and farm mortgage payments. Other legislation brought unemployment compensation and old age security payments. All this was part of his New Deal, which was a series of major recovery programs intended to bring the U.S. out of the Depression. In many cities, the federal government provided hot lunches for children of the poor, as well as daycare for working mothers. Roosevelt's administration also came up with the food stamp program. The stamps could be exchanged for food at any market. In turn, this enabled farmers to sell their surplus crops. In later programs, Roosevelt established the Works Progress Administration. The WPA boosted the economy by giving the unemployed an income. In return, they went to work on thousands of federal projects. During this time, 78,000 bridges were built, more than 600,000 miles of new roads, and 115,000 new buildings, including schools, post offices, and hospitals. Another program, the Resettlement Administration, 
made an important contribution at this time. Professional photographers were sent out to document the living and working conditions of ordinary Americans. Some of the best records of America in the 30s are the images captured by these photographers. Roosevelt's New Deal was political and economic revolution. Never before had the U.S. government intervened so dramatically in the economic, social, and cultural development of the country. It had a downside, of course. Government spending skyrocketed, and you could forget about balanced budgets. But it made Roosevelt very popular. He would enjoy an unprecedented four terms in office. When America's economy crashed in 29, U.S. bankers began calling in their loans all around the world. This was a particular problem for Germany, because its recovering economy was built upon those loans. Without this support, the economy collapsed, companies went bankrupt, and unemployment soared. Recovery seemed hopeless. except for the ideas of Adolf Hitler. His National Socialist Party came to power in 1933 and immediately set to work on Hitler's vision of a great revival for Germany. In a massive public works program, the Nazis built new roads and bridges and increased foreign trade, steel production, shipbuilding, and automobile production. Hitler also ignored completely the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles. He built up his army, air force, and navy, and he launched a rearmament campaign on a scale never seen before. This combination of public works projects and the build-up in arms manufacturing quickly brought Germany out of the Depression. In 1939, the Nazi army occupied Czechoslovakia and launched a brutal invasion of Poland. Britain and France declared war on Germany in 1939. British Commonwealth countries like Canada and Australia declared soon after. The Depression ended in those countries when their factories began churning out munitions and war materials. A vast number of unemployed suddenly had jobs to go to and paychecks at the end of the week. Young men who hadn't worked in years put on uniforms and proudly headed for Europe. The United States resisted international pressure to join in the fight against the Nazis. Most Americans wanted nothing to do with it. But they did start to find work again in American factories that were producing arms and munitions and sending them overseas to the Allies. Roosevelt knew that joining the fight was inevitable. But it wasn't Germany that brought the U.S. into the war. It was Japan. Like most countries that enjoyed trading on a global scale, Japan was hit hard by the Depression. When the Tokyo government seemed to be incapable of dealing with the continuing high unemployment, the military took action on its own. Its solution was simple. Japan had to expand its territory, acquiring resources, raw materials, and heavy industries. In 1931, the Japanese military invaded Manchuria. Six years later, the army was marching south through China in a brutal war of expansion. Japan thumbed its nose at the rest of the world's disapproval, well on the way to economic recovery. <laughs> 
FDR wasn't impressed. And in June of 1941, America cut off its supply of oil to Japan. Japanese leaders were infuriated. They depended on imported oil to fuel Japan's military muscle. The Japanese then set their sights on the oil-rich Dutch East Indies. Before invading, however, they had to remove the threat of the U.S. Pacific Naval Fleet. Early Sunday morning, December 7, 1941. In a surprise attack, the Japanese bombed the American Naval Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Within hours, Roosevelt declared a state of war with Japan. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Four days later, Germany and Italy joined their Axis ally and declared war on the United States. As America geared up, factories went full bore and assembly lines started churning out everything from bombs and planes to tanks and uniforms. The choice was simple. You became a soldier or went to work to support what soldiers had to do. And there was plenty of work. The depression in America was over. How did the world change after the hard lessons of the Great Depression? Well, for one thing, people began to hold their governments responsible for the performance of the economy. Almost every country affected by the Depression brought in new regulations to control the operation of banks and the stock market. Businesses began to pay closer attention to the long-term health of their markets, avoiding stockpiling and broadening their base. And it's important to remember that the 30s weren't all doom and gloom. Even during the worst of it, most people were still employed. There was less money to go around, but many people still had a good time. They still enjoyed their families and their friends. They loved to play, and they loved to be entertained. From local talent shows to the latest Hollywood movies. I got it. Now what'll I do with it? Like a symbol of the times, dust storms continued to roll across the Great Plains throughout the Depression. The drought ended in 1939. As the rain soaked the earth and trees were planted to reduce erosion, farmers began to grow their crops again. And those who lived through the worst of those times carried with them a certain wariness a look of suspicion that spoke of hard times and hunger and of wasted years. <laughs>